Hello friends, welcome to another edition of Pursuit of Praise, our study of the Psalms. Tonight we're going to take part of chapter 30 and study Psalm 90. Let's begin with prayer. Our God and Savior, thank you for your many kindnesses to us. And as we look at Psalm 90, a familiar and powerful psalm, Lord, we pray that you'll give us wisdom. That's our prayer, just as it was Moses' prayer in this psalm. Wisdom to understand and wisdom to apply. And we pray your help in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 90 is, uh, in the title, A Prayer of Moses, the Man of God. Interestingly, Moses is mentioned just eight times in the book of Psalms, seven of them here in book four, which is Psalms 90 to 106. So we'll uh, talk about that a little more in a moment. So we're going to observe four truths tonight, and uh, the first of which is letter A on your page 60. That is, God is timeless. God is eternal. Verses 1 and 2. Lord, through all the generations you have been our home. Before the mountains were born, before you gave birth to the earth and the world, from beginning to end, you are God. So uh, what are we learning here? Verses 1 and 2, we're learning that God is our home. And that word translated as home here is also translated in uh, various ways. So uh, it can be understood as home in the sense of dwelling place and uh, that word is used as a den for animals, the dwelling place of animals in Job, in Psalms, and by the prophet Nahum. It can also refer to heaven as God's dwelling place. We see that in Deuteronomy and 2 Chronicles and also in Jeremiah. A third use of this word is to refer to uh, places and occasions where we experience a bit of heaven here on earth. Uh, we have examples of that in 1 Samuel and in the Psalms. Then finally, it can be understood as a place of refuge. Refuge from our enemies, refuge from our troubles and trials. And it's used that way in Psalm 71.3 and 91.9. Now, um, book uh, three ended with a very agonizing question. And let's go back in chapter eight, or excuse me, Psalm 89, verse 49, to read that question. Lord, where is your unfailing love? Psalm 90, I believe, attempts to provide an answer to that question. Where is God's unfailing love? Well, it's there the psalmist asserts, um, but it can feel distant or absent when we're facing trials. Let's look at verse 4. Uh, again, we're noting first the timeless existence of God. You turn people back to dust, saying, oops, sorry, that's verse 3, for you, a thousand years are as a passing day, as brief as a few night hours. Well, 
to us, from our perspective, a thousand years is several generations. But to God, uh, a millennia is like a day or night, just moments of time, not, not any great amount of time. And that's a way of poetically illustrating God's timelessness. Now, in contrast, letter B, people have a limited time. And we'll go back to verse 3 for this. We read, You turn people back to dust, saying, Return to dust, you mortals. And this is based on the account of the creation of human beings in Genesis chapter 2, when God formed Adam out of the dust. And the fact that we are mortal means that we have a limited amount of time in this world and that at the end of that limited time our bodies decay and in effect return back to dust. So again, this is a, a poetic kind of uh, figure of speech that is based on the creation account in Genesis, which of course was also alluded to in verse 2. So uh, what we see here is that at God's command, life ends. And our days were numbered uh, before, long before we were born, and as Moses alludes to here, long before creation itself occurred. All right, so we have a limited amount of time. A lifespan is comparatively very brief. And so, verses 5 and 6. You sweep people away like dreams that disappear. Here's Sable, the Bible dog. Uh, they are like grass that spring up in the morning. In the morning it blooms and flourishes, but by evening it is dry and withered. This is another figure of speech used by the psalmist to illustrate the brevity of human life. We are like a, a blade of grass or a clump of grass that springs up in the morning because of the dew and then throughout the heat of the desert day and the sun beating down on it it dries out and withers. It has a lifespan that goes from sunrise to sunset. This also teaches us that death is the inevitable end. Now some would say that this psalm sets out a, a kind of pessimistic tone, uh, but the fact is um, that this is um, what many of the psalmists believe and that Revelation would later on uh, give us uh, a better hope than what we see expressed here, the hope for eternal life after our time in this world has concluded. Verse 10, we read, Seventy years are given to us, some even live to eighty. But even the best years are filled with pain and trouble. Soon they disappear and we fly away. The uh, uh, psalmist here is being optimistic in terms of lifespans. We believe that most people in this time uh, did not live 70 or 80 years. Moses himself lived beyond 80 years. Uh, and the uh, comment here about the best years being full of pain and trouble are uh, reminiscent of the writer of Ecclesiastes who made similar observations and I think if we're honest about life uh, we recognize its shortness and its difficulties 
the pain and trouble of life really is undeniable. Now, I want to um, read to you a short section from the book of Job, chapter 7, verses 1, and 10, 1 through 10. And you just kind of follow along and, and look at Psalm 90, especially verse 10, and see if this doesn't sound very similar to you. Job 7, 1 to 10. Uh, and this is, who's speaking here? Eliphaz, I believe. Yep. Is not all human life a struggle? Our lives are like that of a hired hand, like a worker who longs for the shade, like a servant waiting to be paid. I too have been assigned months of futility, long and weary nights of misery. Lying in bed, I think, when will it be morning? But the night drags on, and I toss till dawn. My body is covered with maggots and scabs. My skin breaks open, oozing with pus. And then Job cries out, My days fly faster than a weaver's shuttle. They end without hope. O oh God, remember that my life is but a breath, that I will never again feel happiness. You see me now, but not for long. You will look for me, but I will be gone. Just as a cloud dissipates and vanishes, those who die will not come back. They are for it, gone forever from their home, never to be seen again. And as we've observed in, in other psalms, these very frank and um, sometimes dismaying uh, and negative sounding assessments of life uh, are nonetheless in God's word and to be taken uh, really at face value because it's, uh, it's the uh, heart's cry of the psalmist or in, in that case of Job and Eliphaz that uh, these were experiences of difficulty, not days of ease. And even those are not that great and limited in scope. Let's look at verse 12, one more indication of the limited life of human beings. Where Moses has written, teach us to realize the brevity of life so that we may grow in wisdom. And I think this is a, a very good indication of the, right, the character of the writer of the psalm. Because even though he has complained about life, it being brief, it being difficult, uh, he nonetheless does not ask God to extend his years or improve the quality of his life, but instead he asks God to teach us through the fact that life is brief so that we can grow in wisdom. He recognizes the value of wisdom and perhaps he believed that having more wisdom would impart a better quality of life. All right, those are four sections that indicate that we as human beings have a limited lifespan. We're going to learn a third thing, letter C, that God is angered by the sins people commit. Verses 7 to 9. Like the grass, we wither beneath your anger. We are overwhelmed by your fury. You spread out our sins before you, our secret sins. You see them all. We live our lives beneath your wrath, ending our years with a groan. Here we see that we live under God's anger because of our sins, and we die from it. Paul, writing to the Romans, said the wages of sin are death. And that's exactly what the psalmist expresses here in verse 9. 
So, um, Moses uh, understood that misery and death are products of sin. And he rightly feared the anger of God. We are taught in the Psalms and in the Proverbs, and we've mentioned this before, that fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Here we understand that it is a mortal fear. That we are mortally afraid of God because uh, this life that we know, the only life that we've known and experienced, is necessarily brief, and it is brief in part because of sin. So God's uh, wrath is upon us because he knows all. And he knows even our secret sins, the things that we keep secret, the things that we would prefer that other people don't know, the things that would embarrass us or humiliate us if they became public knowledge. Uh, God knows all of that. And so does he have reason for being angry with us? For sure. Verse 11. Who can comprehend the power of your anger? Your wrath is as awesome as the fear you deserve. So God deserves to be feared. Uh, that's a, a new way of looking at it, I think, for most of us. Why does he deserve that? Because he is all-powerful. And the thought of an all-powerful being, being angry with you, should provoke fear. It should cause concern. God's justified wrath and his righteous anger over our sin are incomprehensible to us because we, by contrast, are short-lived and small-minded. We have a limited understanding of these things. We only know for sure what God has revealed to us. So God is angered by the sins we commit. And the fourth thing we're going to learn here in Psalm 90 is that God is nonetheless merciful to his people. So what started out, I think, as a, as a psalm of wisdom now becomes a psalm of lament and pleading with God in verses 13 to 17. Let's take those one at a time. Uh, verse 13. O Lord, come back to us. How long will you delay? Take pity on your servants. So here the psalmist pleaded with God to come back to his people and to show pity on them, to relent in that anger which is so appropriate and yet so stifling. This is an urgent care, uh, excuse me, request for belief. Interestingly, the phrase come back, where he pleads with God to come back to us, is the same verb in Hebrew as verse 3 where God tells people to turn back. So it's all in God's hands. Life, death, it's all His to determine. Verse 14. Satisfy us each morning with your unfailing love, so we may sing for joy to the end of our lives. The psalmist here is asking for daily satisfaction that really only comes from God and that his unfailing love, his covenant love for us, will bring joy to us. Joy in the midst of sorrow and difficulty. So he's asking God to relent in prosecuting the people for their sin and to allow them to feel joy again. So God is our only hope, 
of satisfaction in this life. Verse 15. Give us gladness in proportion to our former misery. Replace the evil years with good. So this is a plea now from the psalmist for God to replace what has been lost. Replace what has been corrupted by sin. And so he's saying replace our misery with gladness. Replace the good, the evil years with good years. Substitute joy for gloom. Verse 16. Let us, your servants, see you work again. Let our children see your glory. And as we have observed many times, when we are in distress, when we are in a time of trial, God can feel to us very distant. That's our perception. It's not the reality. But nonetheless, Moses pleads here for God to be evident among them again. And when you think of the miraculous things that God did through Moses and the things that Moses experienced in the course of his days, the plagues, the parting of the Red Sea, and so on, um, God did miraculous things, so when he seems absent, he seems very absent and very distant. So you can understand uh, how Moses is pleading here for all the people, including the next generations, to see his glory. And then verse 17. And may the Lord our God show us his approval and make our efforts successful. Yes, make our efforts successful. So in verse 16, God, uh, Moses asked God to replace his presence and glory, or his absence and uh, with his presence and glory. Here in verse 17, he's asking God to replace his disapproval and discipline with his approval, replace their failure and frustration with success. So show us approval and make us successful. That's his plea. And that's another aspect of God's mercy, some specific ways in which Moses wanted God to show them mercy. We understand from 1 Corinthians chapter 3 that, um, that God brings the increase in terms of our church life, but also in terms of our personal life, and that's the same thing being voiced here in verse 17. Uh, letter E, asking the question, how did Moses experience God's anger? Well, you won't find that here in Psalm 90. Uh, you'll have to turn to the book of Exodus for that. And uh, the, the main thing was the incident at Meribah where Moses rebelled against God. God said, speak to the rock and water will gush out of it. Moses instead, in anger, took his rock, or his, his staff, and he struck the rock with it. And God uh, became angry with Moses in that moment and told him that he would not enter the promised land, but that instead he would die. And uh, then the people would be led into the promised land. Now, if that seems rather harsh to us, uh, let's remember Moses' own words here in verse 11. Who can comprehend your anger? Your wrath is as awesome as the fear you deserve. So Moses was disobedient. At a crucial moment, rather than speak to the rock and cause it to break and water to gush out, he struck it. 
The difference being, by striking the rock, Moses may have given the false impression that it was the impact of his staff that broke the rock and not the power of God. We know from scripture and from experience that God is most honored and becomes most glorious when he does things that have no human or we might say scientific explanation. So Moses acted in a way that was disobedient but also compromised the witness of God. And we learn from scripture that Moses died and that God himself buried him in a place that no one ever found. So did Moses have these experiences? Very much so. Would this appropriately be a, a psalm, a prayer that Moses wrote? Yes, very much so. My prayer for you and myself is that when we are facing adverse circumstances, when our hearts are broken, that we can focus on God, who is eternal, all-knowing, all-powerful, and even though he has many reasons to destroy us, he relents, he is merciful, and he will replace what you have lost with so much more. Let us be nurtured by that hope. In Jesus' name. Thank you for being here.